Okay, my friends, this is the icing upon the cake. What cake are we talking about? This is the cake right here. What is that doing? What is this all about? How did they do this? How did they do that? How did, did they make concrete blocks and then just blob them up there? This has been a source of long been a source of debate because it really feels like a genuine mystery. Well, it is. Nobody can nobody can figure out how this has happened. Now, maybe we can. Maybe you can. Maybe you can help me figure it out. Let's see if we can figure this out. Because this is how they're going to approach this. They're going to start with an introduction, then they're going to talk about is it polymer, you know, which is, you know, concrete basically, or natural rocks. They're doing a scientific analysis, which is exactly what I do. They're going to have the report, the research, the surface analysis, geophysicists are going to talk about this apparently. Then they're going to show the whole thing in, in I hope, pretty good detail. I haven't gone through it yet. But I see what they're going to be talking about. How was this done? Geopolymer or natural rock? Geologi geological truth of Sechiromama, Peru, ancient architects. So these are the ancient architects channel. And I am going to comment on this under the Fair Use Act. I'm not trying to steal anything from anybody, but I have a different perspective on it probably than anybody else in the whole world. Or at least I have up until now. People are starting to come around. Thank God. So here we go. I'm just going to comment. They're looking at these things and they want to have answers. Analysis. Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. Situated next to Cusco in the Inca heartland of Peru, Sacsayhuaman is one of the most incredible ancient structures in the world. It's truly mind-boggling how such enormous blocks of stone can be so randomly shaped yet so perfectly put together. I've deliberated over it many times because it really felt like a genuine mystery. These are large blocks of limestone, sometimes huge, most of which seem to pillow or bulge out instead of having straight sharp cut faces. Some blocks seem to curve round corners, Others have scoop marks on their faces, and a number of them have the famous nubs. There are many other seemingly bizarre and unnatural features. Each block is irregular, and each one is unique, yet the joints between these limestone blocks are perfect. So how is it even possible? Aside from the debate about just how old the so-called fortress is, there are also many theories regarding how it was built. You know, I want to cut in here right now because this is a fabulous shot. I've always wondered, why, why would they do this? These have to be some form of for fortress walls. And they, as far as I'm concerned, there's got to be something along that line. Why would they do that? Who the hell would do this? And apparently this would be the city area and... Did they surround them? I don't know. I, this is this is kind of a mystery why they constructed them, where they constructed them. I do think I know how they constructed them, and we'll see if we can work this out together. All right? I, I have a lot of information on this. I've been working on this for at least 10 years or more, and I think I pretty much understand what's going on. Some speculate there was a type of stone softening agent added that allowed the limestone to be molded. Others believe that each block is actually man-made from some kind of geopolymer mixture, whether cast in moulds or just worked into giant lumps of a dough-like substance. Others speculate that these are actually cut rocks, but that some kind of high technology instrument was used to make and shape them. The quarries for these grey limestone blocks are believed to have been located. It is pretty much accepted by all. So, this does imply the blocks were cut from the natural setting and brought to the fortress. And, as some of the blocks weigh more than 150 tons, this feat would be truly incredible. The official view is that each block was cut and shaped by hand using basic tools, until the fit was almost perfect. I, that's amazing that they think that. <laughs> anyway, here we go. Then the blocks were rubbed together, back and forth, back and forth, until a perfect joint was formed. 
but is what we are looking at simply hard labour? Because there are perfect three-dimensional joints on most of the blocks and on every contact surface. It would have taken a huge amount of time and effort. Now, I have a master's degree in geology, I've seen limestone in the field, and I've seen many objects made from different types of limestone. And First of all, we're going to take a look at the chemistry of limestone shortly. Well, granted this doesn't sound too scientific, but something about saxe Horman just feels a bit off. Sometimes the rock just doesn't look real, like some kind of hardened grey play-doh. The blocks don't look like they've been cut from a quarry and stacked. Something about each block just looks artificial. Why do they bulge out on the main face of the wall, like the weight from above has pushed the stones out? This block seems to bend around a corner, and although of course you can cut a block of stone to this and any shape, is it a mere coincidence that the cracks are located on the bend just here? It's just all very strange, and these walls all seem somewhat unnatural. For me personally, just my own thoughts and no disrespect to anyone who disagrees, but I am very sceptical of high technology cutting tools for ancient construction projects. Okay, we're going to see that that's not correct. They did have high-tech tools here that made these blocks. Because if such tools did exist, how did they manage to evade the archaeological record on every continent of the world? Because the, the archaeologists don't pay attention to the evidence. That's how. From old excavations by antiquarians to the more modern systematic approach. I just think that by now we would have found something. But so you know, this is, the, this is what kills me, is I've been pushing this to Yale, to the top people at Yale, Harvard, everywhere, the, my results of what I have. And I have DNA, I have CAT scans, I have the actual body parts of the creatures, and these are body parts. And they came from giant creatures. That is, this is why. This has been dismissed and denied, and we never found anything. We just can't find anything. Yes, they can. They just refuse to examine it because it destroys their reality. Saying that, and for Saxe Horman in particular... Let me just go back to that, because this is, this is important to understand. This is the key to this whole thing. All right? He says, uh, listen to what he has to say. It's just all very strange, and these walls all seem somewhat unnatural. For me personally, just my own thoughts and no disrespect to anyone who disagrees, but I am very sceptical of high technology cutting tools for ancient construction projects. Because if such tools did exist, how did they manage to evade the archaeological record on every continent of the world? Totally just ignored. Ignored. It's, I've been pushing this. Wait till you see what I show you. It's going to blow your mind right out of your head because I'm sure you've never seen it before or unless you've been looking at what I show from old excavations by antiquarians to the more modern systematic approach. I just think that by now we would have found something. <laughs> but saying that, and for Saxe Horman in particular, I'm also not sold on the idea that these are natural rocks, cut from a quarry, worked by hand and stacked accordingly. I've speculated in the past that maybe some kind of stone softening agent was applied, possibly some kind of acid, and this would allow us to manipulate the surface of the limestone. Limestone does dissolve in certain types of acid, but although this may be able to explain the perfect joints, I'm not sure it can explain the bulging appearance of the faces of the blocks. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to just stop it right at this point and, and show you the evidence that I have that shows exactly what this is. Uh, the bumps, the bulging, the perfect fits, everything, and the equipment they used to do this job. You know, I, I was going to cut off and go to my stuff because I really don't want to use too much of his work. I'd like to have you come up here and watch this in its entirety, and I will put a link to this if I remember. <laughs> I, if I don't, just tell me and I'll put one up. Now, he's talking, because I went a little further in here, and he's made it some very important statements. Listen to this, what he says. Though this may be able to explain the perfect joints, I'm not sure it can explain the bulging appearance of the faces of the blocks. 
At the end of the day, we can stare at pictures and speculate forever. What we need to be is scientific. I've always said that samples need to be taken and the geology needs to be analysed and that will tell us everything we need to know about Saxey Horman. Well, little did I know that such work had already been done and I tweeted all about it quite recently. The findings were quite incredible, almost too incredible, and maybe that's why they are not widely known. What happens when the prostate enlarges and the urine channel gets tight? You have an enlarged All prostate right, this due to five seconds <laughs> morning ritual. All right, let's get back to this now. Here we go. At the end of the day, we can stare at pictures and speculate forever. What we need to be is scientific. I've always said that samples need to be taken and the geology needs to be analysed and that will tell us everything we need to know about Saxe Horman. Well, little did I know that such work had already been done and I tweeted all about it quite recently. The findings were quite incredible, almost too incredible and maybe that's why they are not widely known. I found out that geophysical and geological analysis had seemingly been done through official channels and an official report was made, yet it seems that nobody is talking about it. The work does feature on a few websites from 8 or 9 years ago, there are a few videos on YouTube but the work has not permeated to a larger audience, and I really don't know why. Detailed petrographic work has taken place on the blocks of Saxe Horman. There are at least nine samples already analysed from across the site, as well as a comparative study to samples taken from the associated quarry, the proposed origin of the stones. To me, the findings were quite shocking because it changed everything I thought I knew about this incredible ancient wonder. Alright, now, again, I haven't seen this yet, and I, I don't want to steal this guy's thunder here, but I do want to get to a point where he makes his determination, and then I can present my evidence. So, I'm, again, Fair Use Act, I'm just, this is, Fair Use is for transformative dis discussion. And I, what I am going to show is transformative, unless he shows something that's more transformative. But last week, I deleted my tweets on the subject because some people were questioning the authenticity of the study, of the science and the report. The final report wasn't in the form of a peer-reviewed paper, but then again, it was never planned to be. The purpose of the work was to find out why Saxe Horman was deteriorating so badly. People were asking me, if this is legitimate information, why isn't it so widely known? And that's a good point. Why are the findings of an official report not widely known by everyone with an interest in ancient civilizations? For some background, in the past few decades, the Saxe Horman archaeological complex has witnessed a number of destructive natural processes. The stones were deteriorating. Large cracks were opening up in the main walls. We see the shifting of stone blocks and the recession of walls. This could well have led to irreversible change to the site. And so, nine years ago, under the guidance of the Ministry of Culture of Peru, geophysical and geological analysis was undertaken by a team of Peruvian, Russian and Ukrainian scientists, employed by the Ministry of Culture to get to the bottom of the cause of the damage. There was a clear objective, and a clear set of tests were given the green light. On this picture, the sections of the wall that contain fractures are highlighted in orange. The red parts are where the wall is already destroyed. You can see here the wooden frames that were added to keep the wall stable, which is really quite a worrying sight. It was found that the movement of water beneath the walls was destabilising the foundations of the fortress. The soils were fissuring, processes that were going on at quite some depth. The megalithic walls were therefore subsiding naturally. The site can be saved by working on a new drainage system and I would assume that this work has now taken place as the report was published nine years ago. But on top of this, experts had also long noted extensive erosion on the surfaces of a great number of Saxe Horman blocks. Remember this block right here. I mean, 
That is as deteriorated as this kind of stuff gets, and I will explain what this kind of stuff is. And so, rock samples were also taken to find out exactly what's going on. It's one thing to stop the walls from collapsing, but another to stop the individual blocks eroding. Exactly. The individual blocks, as I will show you, are taken from different spots in biology. And this is biological. So, a variety of samples were taken for geological testing, including a microscopic look at the geological microstructures, the characteristics of the rocks, the chemical composition, and so on. The first and most basic test was to find out the rock type, which was assumed to be limestone, something we all say today, and seemingly confirmed by the fact that a sample completely dissolved in vinegar. Because of the composition of the blocks, researchers concluded that even small amounts of acid in rainwater would damage them. And, over time, it could well destroy them beyond repair. Therefore, it was recommended that the blocks of saxe Holman were to be covered with a protective coating, which again may have already taken place, I don't know. So, that's the background on why geological work has taken place in recent years, and it is well documented. Okay, that's the key. It's well documented. Now, let's, I'm going to jump forward if there's anything more that's important, because I can show you what my take is, and I have evidence to support what I'm saying. And, um, you know, they just showed you that acid with, with vinegar is acidic, and it dissolves limestone which is, is um, a calcium carbonate, CaCO3 primarily. So, and this all plays into the great flood that happened, which I will explain was the source of all this material. Okay, the first thing I want to address is the chemistry. This is basalt. Then there's another thing called limestone. So what is basalt? Basalt is made up of silica mineral, minerals and essentially carbonated minerals. CaO percentage of 50%. Basalt is richer in iron. Iron is blood. So basalt is, and this is very bloody right there, is red blood. Now limestone is the tendinous material. It doesn't require blood. So it, Basalt is richer in iron, 12%, versus 0.4% for limestone. They reveal, well, and then that fire loss, that doesn't mean anything. But this basalt is basically like tendon. It has a lot of tendinous material in it, but it's, it's more iron in it. It's, um, it's more muscle, basically. Now, when they show out things wrapping around in corners and all that, this is selenite. This is nothing more than tendon or muscle that's been in a chemistry that was so invasive that it just pushed everything else out and left just basically silicates in here. Now, you can see the curve to it. That's, a, that's, I, that's some kind of a muscle that was wrapped around the bone. The bones just dis disintegrate. That's why you never find any bones in mud fossils. They, the bones turn to stone. That's a bone. That's 100% certain it's a bone. But not only did the bone turn to stone, the, sil the um, cartilage did too. Everything did. Even the membranes, the whole nine yards. And that's because of the conditions of this particular flood. It was a hot water flood because we almost got impacted by Venus. All recorded throughout history. Now, this is again a tendon. So now this is probably muscle. And that's it curves around like this. The tendons are sometimes just as flat as a pancake as this is. And this is unbelievably an abrupt transition right here. And this reddish looking stuff, that's the glue. That's literally the glue that glues abrupt transitions together. Isn't that something? I got the microscope fired up. We'll take a quick look at some of this stuff in there. Now, this is another little piece of, um, it looks to me like it's a piece of tendon, but it has some blood left to it. Very little blood in tendon. Very, very little blood. 
And even muscles can wa completely wash out the blood, wash completely out of there. Virtually no blood. There's a tiny little taste in here. We'll look at this in a microscope and see if we can make a, a determination. But this is where the stuff that he's shown wrapped around walls and so forth, unusual structures. This is basalt. A little bit different than limestone. Limestone is the white looking stuff. And it's only because of the iron. The iron content in here is much more because it's more muscly. It's basically muscle. Anything can turn to anything, basically, depending upon the conditions it was in. This is literally a hair follicle from a gigantic, gigantic hair. And that's the erector pili muscle that makes the hair go up on end and do this kind of stuff. And this right here is a sebaceous gland. That's the hair stalk. And it wraps around the bottom. This is a vein and an artery at the bottom. This is virtually no question what this is. And I believe they would call this limestone. Because it was in a condition that it washed out all of the iron. All right, and left uh, almost no iron. That's that the muscle can turn to limestone too, I believe. All right, that's what I'm finding. It's like this is muscle, and this this would have been limestone if it was in a condition where it didn't get so completely invaded. This gets a little bit tricky. It, it's not that hard to understand, but it's it's you got to do a little work. All right, so this is basalt. Now this is basalt, and it's got a lot of red blood in it. So this is basalt with little red blood in it, because the red blood ran down this way. This, when this thing died, it was in this condition, and the red blood ran down and collected at the bottom. So the top is a different basalt than the bottom, but it's still all basalt. And that red blood will rehydrate very quickly with just a little bit of moisture and then you can really see you can see the standout between the red blood and the not red blood so what does that tell you there's two different types of basalts right there all right now the more red blood you get in there the le the more it can deteriorate that's what they're finding on these walls. And I, sh I think I showed you, or I will show you, some really, really deteriorated spots. Terribly deteriorated. But this is all where the red blood was. And up in here, you see up here is that where it didn't get the red blood in it. So we, have, we got two basic types of stone in the same stone. And then on that same stone, all around the edge here, is feldspar totally different than in the middle and it's because of the chemistry of the body you have membranes that is a membrane you see this whole thing is exactly the same exactly the same it's all the same membrane and then in the middle is where all the the bloody tissue was that made this work as a sarcomere this is a, a, a muscle sarcomere all right so my point is, is that anything can turn into anything. This hair root, I believe they'd call this limestone because it looks to me like it has a lot. I, and I don't have the, the, the chemical resources to test all these things. But I believe they'd call this limestone. Anyway, it, 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 my point is, anything can turn into anything. This is a heart. And this heart turned into like what they call a water opal. Here's another one right here. This is another heart. And this is another water opal. You see that? That's the uh, aorta. And this, this right down here runs down to the bottom of the heart. This is another red blood here. So you got your aorta here. And whatever that is. There's one of these. There's an aorta and then there's a valve in the middle. And then, uh, I can't remember the rest, but it's, this is a heart. And that's where it wraps around, the muscle wraps right around, you see? More muscle wrapping around here. That's one of the tubes right there. 
And that's the other tube right there, the aorta. <laughs> I, it's just crazy. And this, again, that's muscle. You never expect it to turn into that. All right, let me set it up for you. This is the aorta side, which is the red blood, I believe. This, there's a valve in the center there, and then we come over to this one. This whole thing here, I don't know if you can see it or not, but that's a round tube right there. And that is the black side. See, it's dark. That's where the vein would have been. All right, because one side has the vein blood and one side has the red blood. And that's what this is. It's the heart. And right in between, there's like a little pinchy valve. And that's it right there. There's the vein side. And there's the artery side. And this whole thing is that heart. All right, remember I showed you the hair follicle? This is what it is. That's this erector pili muscle. This is the sebaceous gland. Now, mine and the sebaceous gland is way down here, so I think it must have fallen, slid down there. Or, the anatomical is not correct, but I find that hard to believe because this is such an obvious thing. Now, this is the one I have right here that I showed you before. And this is in the microscope. The microscope's way up there. Now, what we're looking at right here, whoops, where is it? Hold on. There it is right there in the microscope. I know mean, it's a long distance off, but it gives us it's still a very good, good, sharp, clear look at it when I turn the lights off and put a little more light on that. And then tweak it in a little bit. All right, that's pretty good. Now, that's the sebaceous gland. I'm going to just sort of manhandle this thing around. That's the sebaceous gland. You see it? Remember you saw it in the picture? You can always go back and look. This is the hair. You see the flat spot? When I saw it, I said, boy, that's kind of strange. Why is there a flat spot? And then people started telling me I have curly hair and I have a flat spot on my hair. Now, this is where the erector pili muscle attached and that's where it embedded right into the hair follicle so your your pillow muscle can pull your hair like that where it says your hair stood up on end well that's what this is and at the bottom we have the the two spots right there there's a vein and an artery and that's where the the hair starts to wrap around it, it goes down from the bottom it wraps around and comes right up through the top. And this is all like the skin around it. Alright, so that's, I like to prove the things I say, and that's proof right there. Alright, this is that solenite, and this is a tendon. Now, just like any tendon, it has that coating on it. See the white, the real white, white here? That's the membrane that surrounds the fibers. Now, I, it's going to take a second for that to dry up. I just put a little moisture on there so that we could get a good contrast. And you can still see a little blood here and there. See the blood? I see all those fibers in there. See all those fibers? That's what tendon has. It's just saturated with fibers. And that's, of course, the coating that is the membrane. And everything has a membrane on it. So that's this selenite. And that's what you're looking at right there. Right, that's, that's the selenite. That's the, and, and this is an abrupt transition right there. That's an abrupt transition. Isn't that amazing? Look at how flat that is right there. That whole line goes across. And this is literally glue. This is this stuff glues the tendinous material together. It's, it's and that's that glue is unbelievable. And see here's this is a whole different section. See this going here this way? I don't know if you can. Let me home right in on that because boy, I'll tell you this is very cool to me. It is anyway. All right, 
right, you see this? I don't know if you will or not, but this here comes out this way, very, very fine stripes, and then you have an abrupt transition. It's totally the different direction. It runs this way. So now you have them running up this direction. And this, the film on this is just like, it's so thin, it's like, you could just scrape it right off. You see how this is? I just picked that right off with my fingertips. Watch. You see this? And one, one, just this one, that one little flake right there, is probably 50 layers thick. That one little flake. I'm not kidding you. The amount of layers is just unbelievable. A little spot that I just scratched there. You see that? That's where I just scratched away at some of that. Just a tip, just that like so thin, it's like a hundred times thinner than a piece of paper. And you see how many depths of these fibers there is in here? These fibers, it's just incredible how many depths of fibers are in this this one little piece of solenoid. You see it right there? This is what I did. I scratched that one little spot where those little bumps were right there. Scratched it in and that's all it was, we were looking at right there. You see it? That's it right there. Those are those little scratches I put in there. And that's how many, every one of these little blocks is a, in some of the creatures, it's just these little blocks are feet long, many feet long, and feet thick. And in here, they are so thin that, you know, there is nothing really that's made is any thinner than what you can slice these into. It's, uh, you know, I really have no big explanation for how all these creatures were so large and could have fit on this earth. So don't just say, oh, that can't be because that they were just too big. They're here. This is biology. This is proven. My stuff is DNA tested, CAT scan, and all that stuff. So this is no joke. And the size of the creatures just... I can't find anything that wasn't biology. And those walls down in Peru are all biology, and they were constructed by creatures with advanced equipment. That's the other statement I want to address right now. Yes, they had advanced equipment. Okay, my friends, so here's my claim. Here's those walls. This is where they cut these slabs from. And when I say cut these slabs, they were wet when they cut them, and I can prove that. And this, my friends, is a tendon. And I can pretty much prove that, too. And limestone is tendon, CaCO3 primarily. They had equipment. This was done at the same time they extracted, extracted those slabs, which were wet like putty. That's why they bulge out. That's why they fit perfectly. And they just had some kind of equipment. You see these tracks run way out to here. They knew what they were going to be using here. And how did they get this thing here? It didn't drive up here. It doesn't look like to me. It looks like it must have come out of the sky. I don't know. I have no clue. But I can tell you what. It goes way out to here. And these are designed to, to claw their way up, it looks like to me. These are like tank treads. And then it's got these. Now, whether these were stabilizers to lock it in here so that it wouldn't go sliding down. And that's a stabilizer up here so that it wouldn't come down this way. I don't know. All I can do is tell you what I'm looking at. You're looking at the same thing I am. Now, what's really cool here is this, uh, you see this stuff here? That's the same stuff as this. That's the same stuff as this, only it's backwards. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. It's the same stuff. Anyway, they cut these things, and then they transported them down. How they did that? Je ne sais pas. I do not know. But this is what they did. Cut them from here from some very good equipment. See here it is down there. This is down in Bolivia. Fuerte de Sempiata. And here they are cutting the slabs, the same type of equipment. 
And this is not the only place too, there was other places they had the same type of equipment they were using. Alright, you see this is Achilles tendon. That right there is the tendons that we're seeing, the one I just showed you that all the cuts coming out of it. This little crease right here is one of the abrupt transitions where it starts to change as they come forward. And um, this is the, the kind of stuff that we're seeing. And we, the kids actually slide down these on slides. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> you see this? Here they are. They're sliding down them. They got them nice and polished up. This is limestone. And apparently in this particular area, the preservation was fabulous. And um, you can see some of this little, the same thing like you're seeing here. This little bloodyish stuff. And that goes on the slurpees of every, every, you know, anyway. There's always, you got blood everywhere. We live in, we, j we are just a creature inside of a package of blood. And if you don't have that blood moving through you all the time, you're not going to be healthy. Now, tendon doesn't require much blood at all, almost none. It's just really a structural component. Very, very little, little, you know, biology going on here. It's just more of like a, like a structural piece of rope. It's, and it gives just a little tiny bit. That's all it does. And it requires very, very, very little blood. And it's very distinct. It's quite obvious what that is. All right, so here's the deal. Every single tendon attaches to a muscle. Everyone. I don't care where it is, your foot, your fingers, your everywhere. Now, what happens where it attaches here? What if they were cutting slabs out of here and they ran into here and they said, ah, just grab a couple last ones before you get to the really nasty stuff. And this is what they did in this next shot. They, they decided they'd go in for some of the garbage. You see what they did? They went right in for the muscle. That's muscle. That's this block right here. You see that? That red, that's muscle, that's blood. And that right there would have been the outline of the muscle. And of course you have tendon next to your muscle, but like I say, they went in deep. And they took this, they took that, look at this one, look at this thing up there, that thing is just rotten. This must have been the really bad end of town. I mean, look at this. They took all the garbage and put it up here. These are all junk. This is junk. You want to see some really good good looking stuff but this is all biology and it's all rotting away so they're trying to come up with some grand solution for this and you have to take it block by block basically where did they cut that out of that was from a bad spot now let me show you some really cool ones hold on all right everybody's seen these with these little bumps sticking off and they say well, what the heck is this right side by side look at that and this is the best stuff because it, it's really clean. Now, what's growing on here is some algae and it's growing on some biological leftovers that are still in these blocks. See how beautiful this is? It's, it's, they still have the bumps all over here and there. Now, this is the guy I want working on my house. <laughs> Look at how beautiful that is. Can you imagine? That was some serious craftsman. And I, got, I can almost guarantee you this was for one of the aristocrats. Almost no question whatsoever. <laughs> now this is where those bumps came from. They're on these flat plates of tendon. This is, this is another type of tendon. The other ones were big long straps and they had balls at the end. Well these have balls too. On a strap. But they're flat like this and they on your um, abdomen and so forth and the tendons that are on your back and things like that. I think these balls are what they call tendon emphasis and that means they end right here and they lock in there and this is an injury, a sports injury. The guy pulled a, a muscle or the tendon basically and he pulled it right out of that thing and I've done this myself and it hurts like hell. Now that strap is flexible all right they have to be flexible that ball is hard as as a marble unbelievably hard these are pretty tough but they're flexible this is also extremely tough and flexible 
Now, when these creatures died, it just laid flat. And then you'd see bump, 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 bump. And these are the bumps that you see running right down the walls. And they, all they did was snap them off. And I think they did some, uh, there's a wall I saw that was a test wall, I think, to see what the best way to deal with these. <laughs> I, I'm not kidding. It was what it looked like to me. You see that? I, did, I don't see any reason to make that wall. Why would you make a wall like that? They broke them off right here. And if you look real close, you can see the center of the things. They just broke them here. And this is a, a, a securing spot that holds the tendon a little tighter. And they all have that. They're sort of like a really grabby sort of thing that supports that strap so that it doesn't pull out of there. Then they steeze, they just scrape them right down flat. Did they start out this way? I don't know. I don't see any evidence of that. This one's scraped down, but it does have one of these little bumps down here. This, I don't know what's going on there. Why would you do that? So to me, that looks like something I might do <laughs> to try to see if these, how are these going to end up? Are they going to wash right off of there? Well, anyway, they, that's another mystery. That one there, I can't tell you. I have no idea. But I can tell you what it's made of. It's made of these tendinous materials. And these are the flat mat tendons. Now this is down in Peru where they're scooping these things out and putting them up on the walls and they did the same thing in Egypt it looks like. They were all doing the same stuff. I don't think anybody had, well, you see that? So I think they used the same machine. Now here's another one that's made out of really garbage that was leftovers. It's, that, that's not a good clean tendon wall by any means. This here is by far the best, and they made the best slabs with this. It looks to me like it's Achilles tendon. It could be any long tendon in the body, but it's, it really looks like an Achilles tendon to me. Because they go for a long distance. They're not very short. And a lot of the tendons are pretty short. Now don't forget, the Achilles tendon is absolutely nothing like this tendon. It's totally different. This is a flat mat. The Achilles are like strips of, well, you saw what they were. You see that? Getty images. This is a tendon all smooshed up. That's how many fibers there are in a tendon. It's absolutely, unbelievably strong fibers. Now, right, here's another evidence on top of these tendons, which I believe is an Achilles tendon. This is a, like a four-wheel drive tire truck, something like that. It has these little scoopy things that are obviously designed to go through some kind of terrain like this where they have to scoop their way through it. But this is a tire track. Looks like to me. That's how I'm taking it. See, this is more selenite, this kind of stuff here. Like I say, it depends on the condition that the particular body part was in and I'm going to tell you right now there is nothing but body parts I can find nothing all the dirt and all of that stuff is just eroded flesh and and collagens and all that stuff that's all it is and all of the other things on every rock that I can find a hundred percent of them were from some type of biology that's just a fact if you can find one it isn't I'd love to see it if you cut them open and looked inside of them and microscoped them and checked them all out, you find out they have veins and arteries. They're going to have all kinds of layers and tissues. And the bigger they are, the easier they are to see. That's some kind of flesh. You see that? That is body tissue. That red blood. This looks to me, and this is exactly the way muscle invests into tendon it wraps right around in a circle like that it actually weaves right in and it's actually held in and glued in there like that this is eroded away but that's what was going on there that was being held like this i have muscles here and they they like the tendinous materials down here and it's a really gnarly glue and it grabs a hold of that and holds that muscle so the muscle can do a little of this stuff all right, the tendinous area is, is just pretty solid. It gives a little bit of play, but not much. 
All right, I don't think I need to go much further with this. This is one of those little tendon balls. Well, not little. <laughs> this puppy's kind of good size. Now, that's the strap. That's the ball. At one point, there was flesh or some, some, something here that was body tissue. And that was embedded in it, just like I showed you before where the ball pulled out. Now, there would have been another one right here. You see that little spot? This ran down, I'm sure, to this ball. And they rolled. The, 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 the straps are not as tough as the balls. The balls, they're hard to erode. The straps erode a little easier, and the fleshy stuff erodes much easier. And um, this is what it looks like when they're alive. That was where that ball came out of. And that's the ball. And that was a strap running up to the side of the hill, which was the tendon. It's a, it's a new world, and nobody's had their eyes open wide enough to see this. It's just, it's, you just have to open your mind up. Don't shut it off. Don't shut your mind off. Unless you want to. I don't know. It's up to you. Ignorance is bliss. And, and that's my new acronym I put down now, IIB. <laughs> Ignorance is bliss. I don't want to have to write it out every time. All right, I don't see any reason to go any further. You see, they had the big equipment. That's a statement that, that, that wasn't working from that video. And this is body tissue, and it has all kinds of different components to it. Like I showed you, just this one rock right here is saturated with blood over here, no blood over there. And then, of course, your muscle is going to run into tendon or vice versa. You're going to have organs right next to body parts that are, are not associated to the organ. Totally different components, totally different minerals, totally different crystals, totally different body fluids, different pHs. All of that stuff has to take into account. This is a new world. I understand it pretty well now. And I understand the aluminum silicates and, and a lot of the preservation um, processes that happen to create mud fossils. That's why nobody's been able to understand it because they say, oh, that's impossible. It'll just all rot away and they'll do this and do that. No. You've got to really get deep into antiquity to find out wh when this happened and what was the conditions on Earth. There was a great saltwater, hot water flood because we almost got impacted by Venus. Velikovsky tells the story 100% of the world knew about this flood, washed from history. It was only 3,500 years ago. It was only 3,500 years ago. And all of this stuff had to happen at the same time. These were wet when this was wet. They didn't come afterwards and sink in there when everything dried out and chisel and sh shave all these things so they fit perfect. That's insanity. They came up here while it was wet. And they had a machine that could scoop out big slabs. I think these were slapped and not just scooped and thrown out there as a big slab. Well, I can tell you that one was, slab, was a slab. And they went a little too deep in and took, and took the um, bloody muscle. All right, normally they wouldn't do that. They'd, they'd take the nice, clean, tendinous material. But, you know, you take what you got. <laughs> you know, that's the way I see it. Okay, my friends, I guess I'm not going to continue droning on here, but this is biology right here. These are tendon fibrils, and that's blood running out to service this particular area of tendon. And anytime you see cuts like this and water running through it, it's normally got something to do with a membrane or, or a, a artery or a vein or some type of a duct running through the body of a giant creature just seems to be a fact and all these different colors represent different biology chemistry because the chemistry in your body is completely different in different areas every area in your body all of your organs and there's like eight major organs um, glands basically that create in a secrete different colored juices because it has to do with different chemistry. Some are massive, some of them salts, some of them, you know, they're, they're all kinds of different stuff. So anyway, we're going to do this, and I'm probably going to do one on the pyramids too, because that's another thing totally misunderstood, how the pyramids were built and everything else. So I guess I'm going to leave it here for now. 
And um, I'd love to have some interviews with people that are making claims. And, they, you know, I've tried to to address these claims that are being made with evidence. And uh, it's and I don't seem to be getting too many people willing to address the evidence. So I guess until that happens, we just accept what mainstream tells us to accept or then they put you to the side and especially if you're in school you know these core curriculums they say you have to believe all these things we tell you to become educated otherwise you're not educated well I have evidence to show that these things aren't true if they're not examined and they're not looked at that to me it has a bad odor has a very bad odor. Anyway, that's. I hope you've seen what I showed you, and it makes sense. To you. If it doesn't, give me a comment. Say, why, Roger? This is impossible. This is well. No, don't tell me it's impossible because it's too crazy. Or tell me it's impossible because, well, it isn't impossible. So I don't care what you tell me, but make your point, and I'll listen. I'll listen, and then I'll try to address it scientifically. But just hurling insults, that doesn't, that really, I'm done with that. That doesn't work for me anymore. I've been insulted for many, many, many years now with no basis other than just somebody was intimidated. So if you want to address things, just try to stay on a scientific level. That's all. That's all I'm trying to do. And I find it very difficult to to find people to engage on a scientific level. If they're too educated, they say, this is just too crazy, I can't even look at this because it's too, it just goes so far away from what I was told. And then the other people that are on the other side, they come at me with, I'm not crazy enough. <laughs> I'm not kidding you, it's just, it's just, I've never been so squeezed from two different points in my life. Anyway, I love you all. See what you think, and um, sooner or later, this is going to be mainstream, and you guys are going to be the first ones to understand it. I'm not kidding you. You'll be one of the first educated people on the planet.